All right. Uh, we are beginning a new uh, topic uh, that is called loops. But uh, before uh, I get into that, uh, there were a couple of students who asked me about um, the grading of assignment uh, five. Um, I had taken a couple of points from some students for the test data. So I wanted to talk about that. When I asked for test data, I asked for it in a certain format. The reason is that what we have found in the whole program, not just one class or anything, in the whole computer science major and other majors too in the department, the students have uh, little, I mean, or they don't have enough regard for testing. Uh, so we, we want to emphasize testing because that is crucial to um, developing programs. And um, as you write your code, as you design your system, you're supposed to create test data. In fact, when um, you uh, agree uh, to develop software for some somebody, sometimes, I mean, or not sometimes, all the time you agree on the specifications and that is what you are supposed to deliver. So the client will create their own test data to see what is acceptable and the developers will create their set of test data to decide whether the system is working. So if you don't test your programs, there is uh, no chance that the system will be successful and uh, you have to pay enough attention to that. And what I have found um, very often is that students simply copy the output they get and present it as test data. So I discourage that habit, but, and uh, I cannot get rid of all the bad habits for every student, but I am um, insisting that you submit your test data in a certain format, in a tabular format. So at least I am hoping that you will be encouraged to create the test data before you start running your program. That is a good habit to start and I am, um, insistent upon that. And uh, if you don't submit in the format, you will lose points. Uh, I'm uh, sorry that I have to be adamant about it, uh, but that is uh, the only way I can see that I can uh, develop some good habits into uh, students who start programming. And uh, so I have to do that. Okay. The, uh, uh, right. And uh, you will find that if you uh, start some of these habits early, it will persist with you, like good coding practices, uh, creating test data, writing pseudocode, etc. You, you will be, uh, you will benefit from that. And uh, you will be much better as a professional and you'll be much more successful. Okay. So I hope uh, you will continue to develop a good test data and put that in. Because, and also when you develop test data, you have a better understanding of the program, of the specifications, and you will get, gain some insights into how, you're, how you must code. So that also is helpful. Okay, now, as I was saying last week, this is the time of the semester where you must be really careful because things get really, really hard. And sometimes you understand a solution, but you are not able to create solutions for new problems. And then you uh, look for solutions in the textbook or elsewhere, and you may not find any problem that is similar to what is being asked. That is one of the uh, unique features of uh, this field. You are asked to solve new problems all the time. And some people find that very difficult, very, very um, 
discomforting i mean it's very uh, they find it uncomfortable so uh, that is something you have to accept that you will get new pro problems and you will never find anything that is uh, exactly the same okay uh, so that is one of the skills uh, you will continue to develop through these uh, sequence of uh, courses right so the topic that we are starting today is uh, loops or this week is loops so let, let me go over that okay. um, and i will try to emphasize the more intricate aspects i hope you listen to that um, uh, okay so loops and before, two weeks ago we started selections and initially we had what is called a sequencing that is you write a sequence of um, lines this is how we started the course right sequencing um, this is how we began from day one you write a sequence of lines one after the other, and they are connected in some way. For example, A equals B, and then you write um, C equals A plus one. So this is the first statement. This is the second statement. You are storing into A, B, and then adding one to that. So there is some connection between these. Of course, you need to have B initialized too, right? No semicolons. Right. Um, so you set P to one, use that B and store that into A, use that A to create C, and that is how things progress. You execute line by line. Every line is executed. That is called sequencing. Without sequencing, you probably won't have any programs. Otherwise, you will have to just have one line. You know, I mean, that is probably not going to happen. Then we talked about selections. That is, you don't want to execute every line in the program. You execute a line conditionally. So you decide whether A is greater than eight. And if so, you might write C equals 10 or, so, or something, right? So you, you have this line in your program, but you are deciding in the middle of execution whether that should be executed or not. That was selection. So we did sequencing selections and we are starting this new topic called loops where what we do is we take a bunch of lines and then repeat that over and over again, right? Multiple times zero or more times and uh, the structure would be somewhat like this you write while and then you put a condition you have already seen conditions with if statements this condition here would be exactly like what you came up for if statements. There is no difference. The column you needed for if statements, there is no difference. Instead of if, you write while. That is the only difference in the syntax. So it is very easy to learn. The syntax is extremely easy. You write while and then proceed just like if statements. Write a condition like A less than B and C less than D kind of stuff and put a column and you put code here. So we have one or more statements here. And what happens? If this condition is true, these statements will get executed. So the first, you come from here, right? You're executing and then hit the while you ask, is this condition true? So you're coming like this. We check the condition. If it is true, 
you come here, execute this piece of code. Then this condition will be checked again. And if it is true, you will be doing this. So this is the sequence. You come into the while, check a condition. If it, that is the second thing that happens, then if it is true, execute these statements, then go back and check again. This keeps happening again and again and again until this condition is false. Okay, so this is called a loop. And we are using this construct called while. So this is called a while loop. You can put if statements, you can put loops, you can put just about every statement that you can think of over here. All right. So you can put a lot of Python statements here. They should be indented just like if statements. Right. So that is uh, what uh, we mean by a while loop. Now let's go through uh, the slides. Some of them I will go through very quickly. Some of them I will spend a little more time and I will try to draw your attention when I get to things that are a little more tricky, but uh, also very beneficial in the long run. Okay, So I will try to emphasize the trickier aspects. Okay. All right. So we, this is something that uh, we just talked about. We have a sequence of statements. Suppose you want to print numbers from one to five, then we can write print one, two, three, four, five. But if you had to print um, a thousand numbers, one through thousand, this would be very, very tiresome. It will take you a long time. So what? That is not going to be easy. It is like giving somebody $1,000 in $1 bills. You have to keep on counting, right? That is not a good idea. If you had a $1,000 bill or if you could write a check, that would be a lot faster, but probably Excuse equally uh, painful because you are parting with money, right? Uh, but, uh, Excuse yeah. me, aren't, aren't we on lab seven tonight? Yes, uh, let me see. Four five, six, seven, I think so, yeah. Okay, There's just, you're, this is just lab eight. So, oh, you're looking at the lecture. I'm sorry, I thought you were looking at the lab. My apologies. Okay, okay. all right. Um, so if you want to print numbers from one through thousand, this is what you would do. You would initialize number to one. And while, number is less than 1001, you know that this is going to get executed. Then you will check if number is less than 1001, print number. So you'll be printing, um, or let me back backtrack a little bit. Number is set to one. Python will check if number is less than 1001 and it is. So it will print number, number is one. So it will print one. Then this is part of the loop, right? So a number will be incremented to two and Python will go back and check again. Is number less than 1001? The answer is yes. So it will print number again. And this process keeps on occurring until you get 1000. I mean, eventually it will hit 1000. When number is 1000, it is less than 1001. You will print number, so you'll see 1000 but then number becomes 1001 here, and then 1001 less than 1001 is not true, this false, so while loop ends. So you will get numbers from one through 1000. It's remarkable that uh, with just a 
few lines of code, you are able to get so much output, right? Um, so if you look at real life, we also do loops, but without really being aware of it explicitly. If you give somebody $10 in $1 bills, you are doing the same thing repeatedly. Or if you add up a sequence of numbers, you are processing uh, these numbers one after the other, adding all them up. So that is adding that new number to an existing total is in a loop. Or if you put coffee, spoon by spoon into a coffee maker, you are doing the same action repeatedly, right? So we have a loop until you think there is enough coffee, right? Or if you count people in a meeting or in a gathering, whatever, you, you are doing the same thing. You're just counting up, right? All the time. So you're doing the same process, same action repeatedly. Or you ask, a gathering, ask each person, what is your name? You're re repeating the same question and you are doing it for every person. So here is the structure of the while loop. We, uh, some terminology here, we call this the header, the loop header, this the while with a condition, that is the loop header. This is the loop body, and sometimes it is called a block. Now, this is a very simple example, but it is a very uh, telling example in multiple respects. So I would like you to spend some time and uh, try to understand this. I will explain this, please listen. I want to emphasize a few things also here. It's some general approaches to problem solving, which will come in very handy. The problem here is I want to add up a series of numbers until I get zero, right? So let me, uh, rather than just show you the code, let me try to develop it from scratch. So I have a sequence of numbers. So it is like this. Um, I get numbers three, five, two, negative one, and six. And finally, I get zero. The moment I get zero, the indication is that I should stop adding. So I get numbers three, five, two, negative one, six, and zero. This is an indication that there is nothing more. Let's agree on that. So the total would be eight, 10, nine, 15. So I should be printing 15 here, that is the result, right? Now, if I have to accomplish this in real life, uh, and very often, if you are stuck as to how to solve a problem, very often you can kind of see how you would do it without a computer. Okay, what, are you, what is the thought process? This is computer science, really. I mean, how do we think about this problem? How do we get a solution in real life when we have a problem like this? And we are trying to model it on a computer. That, that is the science part of computer science, how we think. So how do we get this 15? What are we doing as a human? Well, let's try to explore that. Before we started this process of adding, we knew that there would be a total, right? And at this point, I haven't seen any numbers. So I need 
to total or a bunch of numbers. So there has to be, in my mind, a place to remember the total. So or rather, I should remember the total. So I should remember the total. That is the first thing, right? And when before I haven't before I have seen any number, the total is zero. Before seeing any numbers, is zero. So I haven't seen that three or five or any of those numbers. And but I was told I'm going to give. I was told that by somebody. I will give you a bunch of numbers and you add them up. Then I know, okay, I am getting prepared for that. I know that uh, I don't have any numbers. So the total is right now zero. Then I get a number. I add up. I mean, when I get that three, I, I know that the total is now three because really speaking, what I am doing is adding three to the total that I have. So total is now equal to total plus that number. So in this example, it would be total would be three. Then I get a number. Total would be equal to total plus number. Then I get another number. Total equals total plus number. I keep doing this, right? And at some point, this will end because I'm getting, going to get the number zero. So at some point, maybe not right now, but a little later, or let me put a few dots here saying this will can go on for a while if number is zero print total and that then i won't do anything more this is what i am doing manually if you could just this, I might start this at 10 o'clock in the morning and I might end at five past 10 or some such thing. So this is what happens during that time frame. Keep getting numbers and I'm adding them up. If you look at this process that I'm doing manually, I see that things are getting repeated like these two would be repeated here. So I will be getting more numbers here, right? So you can kind of see that this, these two lines is the same as these two lines and these two lines. So I'm adding number to a total and then getting a number. And before anything happened, I got a number. So I, I mean, I could have said these two are repeating, right? I'm repeating get a number and total equals total plus number, but there is, I'm, that would also be another way of viewing it, that these two lines are being repeated. But instead I am going to say, these two lines are going to be repeated, okay? So there is a reason for it, the way that I, I mean, I'm fully okay with people viewing it the other way. This is not the only way, I am, I am thinking it this way. Right. So if I extract these two lines, maybe I'll right here. Total equals total plus number and get a number. So this is what I consider as repeating, right? 
and let me um, say this again, it is okay to consider these two as repeating, get a number and then total equals total plus number. I am just having a different viewpoint, that's all, all right? Because I find it more convenient, that's all, all right? So this is getting repeated so many times. So in Python terminology, I need some space here. You can write while number is not zero. See, this is the time when you are quitting. So here I am saying, what is the condition for continuing? Notice the difference. Here I am saying, when should I quit? If number is zero, I'm going to quit. I'm going to print the total. Here, because of the way Python works, I need to decide when should I, con what condition should I write here to continue while number is not zero. So for that purpose, I need to read or rather get a number. And the other thing is you should have total initialized to zero. So the whole thing is like total equals zero, get a number while number is not zero, total equals total plus number, get a number. That is my pseudocode. Notice this, pay attention to this. We are getting a number before entering the loop. So if this number is zero, what happens? This would be false. Number is zero, number is not zero is false. You will quit the loop. But if number is non-zero, I will add that number to the total and get another number. And then I will be in the same state, same situation because I have gotten a new number. So whether I come from here to down, or from here back to the loop header, I have gotten a new number. So when I come from the top, total equals zero, get a number, hit the while, I have a new number. Now, if I, I'm in the loop body, at the very end, I'm getting a number and when I go back to the loop body, I got a new number. So either way, I am in the same situation. Sometimes it is called the same state. So that is the pseudocode, uh, the Python code from this is not all that hard to do. This is exactly what Python will also accept. You know how to get a number number equals int input, and then put a prompt. While number is not zero, you know how to do that. While number is not equal to zero. And you know how to do these things anyway, right? So number equals some prompt. I don't have too much space. And the same thing here. And once you finish the loop, you can print total. That is the program. Any questions before we continue? I have a question. Yes. Say you don't put in any information for number, you just leave it blank. How do you prevent yourself from getting a syntax error? Actually, if you, your thing is some, somebody just types in a bunch of spaces or just hits enter, right? Right. Yeah, if that is the case, this program is likely to crash. 
So you want to prevent that. So uh, that is validating the input, right? Like somebody giving you a blank check or something, <laughs> uh, right? Or didn't sign the check or something like that. How do you prevent that? Uh, to prevent it, you have to take a lot of pains. You can do one thing, you can read the stuff without int, okay? Read it as a string, then check whether that string has something, uh, some stuff inside of it. You can, and then uh, we can convert that to a number if it is properly formed. So that is something, we, those things we will look at a little later, but you don't want to straight away assume that the user gave you a number because the, as you said, the user may not do that because the user could make mistakes, right? And so what you have said is a very important point. Uh, the input validation is uh, extremely important in commercial programs because people, do, I mean, people don't uh, always use the programs correctly. I make a lot of mistakes while using programs, right? I type in the wrong things and then yeah, I don't want it to crash. I want it to actually tell me that I made a mistake and what mistake it was. So we'll talk about input validation a bit later, but the short answer is don't assume that it is a number. Just read it as a string and then see whether the string looks okay to you before converting it. I have a follow-up question to that. Sorry? I have a follow-up follow question to that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so in our lab tonight, I, you ask for us to run the program with no input. And um, is a syntax error acceptable in that case, or do you want us to handle that? With, uh, let me go back. Uh, I want to uh, make sure that I uh, addressed every question that you had on the lab, uh, right? Um, today's lab eight, lab seven. Um, Yeah, here it is. Um, the situation here is that there may not be any numbers, right? So what you should do is All you need to do is, if the first number is a negative number, you should simply not do anything, right? Uh, the, the lab problem is says, design and implement a Python program that uses a while loop and selection statements to print the sum of the even numbers and some of the odd numbers read from the keyboard. The sequence of numbers ends with a negative number. So if there is no number, the first number would be a negative number. So all the numbers for printing the two sums are. I think that's where I misunderstood. I think I understand now that uh, you just want us to put in a negative number for the first number. Correct, correct. Okay, thank then, you. Uh, if the sequence is empty, the user has to indicate it through a negative number. Okay, so conceptually there are, there are no numbers, but that number that says there is no number is a negative, there is a number, right? But it's a negative number. And that stuff is called a sentinel, which we will uh, have occasion to repeat. Go back, let me see. I'm trying to find where my share is. Oh God, okay. Well, let me go. I don't know, I didn't know how to get back to my whiteboard. That's why. Okay. All right. Uh, now I'm back. All right. Um, so here uh, I'm trying to embellish on what you uh, what you just said. Here I'm, get, I'm getting a sequence of numbers, and 
zero terminates the sequence. The first number could be zero, which means there are no numbers really. But there is a number, right? Uh, but there are no numbers in the logical world, right? Zero is the terminating number. That is not part of the sequence. This kind of an indicator is called a sentinel. That is the place where you assume the input is over. So very often you will see sentinels in your input. That is something you and your client agree on. And so you have to, uh, I mean, you have to find an appropriate sentinel that is suitable for the problem. I cannot simply say that zero is a sentinel or a negative number is a sentinel. It is very much dependent on the application. Maybe you and I can say, well, negative 10 is the sentinel, you know. Nobody can quarrel with it because that is our agreement, right? Uh, okay. Uh, if it is suitable for us, we will agree, agree, negative 10 or zero. It can be anything. But then whatever we agree on is the sentinel and it has to make sense in the application, right? So for example, if you are expecting all numbers, negative, zero, positive, everything, uh, fractional values, everything, then no number can be uh, a sentinel. It has to be something uh, like alpha numeric, alpha, alphabetic characters, you know, like the word end could be a sentinel. Does that make some sense? That does, that thank okay? you. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so this is what I want you to, uh, to, I mean, among lots of other things, two or three things here. This is called an accumulator. Accumulator. Many times, many, 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 many times, you will need to use what is called an accumulator to accumulate information. This is an example of an accumulator total. It keeps building up. What you do is you initialize the accumulator to something. When you are adding up, it is going to be zero usually, right? And you keep adding to that. That is called an accumulator. And it can be much more general than this. That is one thing. The second thing is something I already mentioned before. We got input here and that is being repeated here. If you try to remember this paradigm, getting the input before or doing some specific action before entering the loop and repeating that action at the end of the loop, you can construct solutions more easily. So try to remember this program, try to memorize this program because it has some crucial things. One is the idea of an accumulator. The second thing is the fact that you are doing something right before the loop begins and repeating that at the end of the loop body so that you are in the same situation when you are in the loop header. That is the second thing I wanted to emphasize. Then a couple of other things. This is a very representative example. When you check a condition, you better have a value for the variables in that. If you don't have values, you are going to get a crash, which means you are not thinking through the problem correctly. So while number is not equal to zero, if number doesn't have a value, you are in trouble. So you get a proper value into number. There is no point in writing number equals eight or something. That is why we have, we are accepting that number from the input and checking if it is zero or not. 
The third thing, or no, the, maybe the fourth thing here. If you are checking for something in a wild body, at least one of those variables must be changed within the wild body. Actually, if you're checking for something in the wild header, this is the header, not the body. I have a variable called number and that number must be changed or at least it must have an opportunity to change within the loop. Suppose this number never changes, what happens? Suppose this variable loop. number, go ahead. It's an infinite loop. Infinite loop. It will never quit. And that is not usually a pretty sight because you will see nothing happening or lots of messages flashing on the screen with no end. Then it will never end. So if you have a while loop, things are different for another class of loops called for loops, which we will discuss next week. If you have a while loop, any variable that is in the condition, in the header, should be initialized before hitting the while loop. If not, it is a crash. You have a logic error. If you look at the condition, at least one of the variables in the condition must be modified or must have a chance to change within the while loop. So the four things I said, they are extremely important. The idea of an accumulator, this kind of structuring with doing something right before the loop begins and repeating it at the end of the loop. That is the second thing. Third thing is initializing all the variables inside the loop header before hitting the loop. Fourth thing is at least one of the variables in the condition must be changed or must have an opportunity to change within the loop body. And finally, I will say one more thing. My goodness, uh, hold on a second. I have a little problem with my power. I don't know why I'm not getting power here. I'll run out of power if <laughs> it goes like this. Okay, maybe I'm okay. All right, I hope it's okay. Where was I? Um, we're talking about uh, the four uh, different things. Yeah, the, there was something else I, that came to my mind. Yeah. My train of thought is gone. Um, all right, sorry about that. Uh, okay, uh, it's almost time to start the class exercise. I have one uh, remark uh, regarding the class exercise. There are some problems where, or many problems, where you can just copy the code, put it into a Python program and execute it and say what the output is or change some numbers and say what the output is. Uh, you can do that. Uh, I'm not going to uh, catch you or I'm not going to take off any points if you do that, but you are not doing yourself any good service if you did that. You are uh, instead, I. I ask that you go through the program, work out what the answer would be. And then if you want, you can verify whether your answer is correct. That way you will learn much more, okay? Um, so I would uh, strongly um, advise against running the program, copying the code and running the program without having any understanding of what is happening there. That doesn't really help anybody except uh, expediting things. But 
you have to learn this at some point in time. So you might as well do it tonight. Okay. Any questions before we stop this? Anybody? Okay, then let me go ahead and uh, stop sharing and uh, stop recording. And I will...